Well, I think that of all of the areas of the Christian life where for me there is a mismatch, a distance between what I believe and what I experience, one of the biggest would be the area of evangelism. I believe that every Christian is called to be a witness to the resurrection of Christ. Every Christian community is called to speak forth the gospel and to demonstrate in deeds the hope that we have. I believe that evangelism, sharing your faith, sharing the gospel, is right up there with prayer and confession and worship and other acts that are central to the Christian life. This is what it means to be faithful in following Jesus, to share your faith. And yet, The reality for me is, I don't enjoy sharing my faith, I'm not particularly good at it, and I don't do it near as often as I think I should. The other day in my neighborhood, there was a a, a boy who knocked on my door, and he, um, this is pretty common in the warm months of the year, there are people who come around and uh, sell things door to door in our neighborhood, and probably two or three times a week, uh, we get a knock on the door, sometimes it's lawn service, sometimes it's home improvement kinds of things, but most of the time it's a kid and they're selling magazine subscriptions or candy bars or something to raise money for some cause or some organization. And this kid knocks on my door. He's probably 11 or 12 years old. I had never seen him before. I didn't know who he was. Uh, It wasn't part of the neighborhood. I know most of the neighborhood kids and and he wasn't one of them. And he knocked on the door and he had a a box of uh, chocolate bars and he said, I'm I'm part of this organization and I want to know if you want to buy chocolate to support what we're doing. And it was the middle of dinner, and I, you know, I was sort of preoccupied, and we can't buy from everybody, and so I just said, you know, no thanks, I'm not interested today. And he pushed back, and he said, well, do you, you might not want the chocolate, but do you at least want to give, like, a donation for the organization? And I hadn't heard of the, the group. I didn't know of the organization. He had no material about the organization. And the things he could tell me, I granted he was a 12-year-old, so he's not going to know the nonprofit status of his organization. But the things he could tell me about the 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 thing were vague, and I was a little skeptical. So it could have been completely legitimate, but in the moment, I was like, ah, I'm not ready to give money to something I don't know. So I said, thanks, but no thanks, and, you know, sent him on his way. And he just slumped, picked up his box, walked down my driveway, and as the the door clicked behind him, I heard him go, come on! And I, I knew what the guy was feeling, you know? He had probably walked up 100 driveways, been through all the, the neighborhood, and had gotten rejected, you know, and, and it, it probably had come to the point where he knew that if he walked up a driveway, even before he knocked on the door, he knew what would happen, that, that the people would pretend not to be home, or they wouldn't want to buy anything, or they'd point to the no soliciting sign on the window or something, and even before his offer was made and people rejected him, he was already discouraged. To me, that's what sharing my faith sometimes feels like. It's not that I've even heard the person's response, it's I assume they don't want what I'm selling. They don't want to hear about it. They've already made up their mind. And if I do share it with them, they're going to be a little skeptical about the claims that I'm making. They're not going to necessarily buy the things I'm claiming. It's hard to share your faith. That isn't always true, but that's what I at least feel. And it keeps me discouraged when I want to talk to people about what I believe. In Luke 24 here, Jesus commissions the disciples to be witnesses of the resurrection It's actually a pretty incredible job, a pretty incredible assignment to be given. They've been sent out to all people, all nations, to proclaim that repentance and forgiveness of sins is available, that you can be reconciled to God, that they have the best news ever. Someone has died and come back to life, and he can save you too. He can give you hope. It's incredible, amazing news. It is a dream assignment to get to proclaim this to the world until Jesus does something that makes absolutely no sense. He leaves. He just ups and gets out of the place. He's gone. And these are the disciples. Now think about what just has happened. The disciples, a few verses before Jesus leaves, are skeptics. They had heard witnesses of the resurrection. I, I mean, if anybody is primed to believe that Jesus raised from the dead, it's the disciples. They've spent three years with him. They've heard him repeatedly predict that he would die and rise again. They didn't understand it, but at least at this point, they had some context. And then a few of them have seen the empty tomb. The the stones rolled away. The graves close are there. A few people claim to have encountered Jesus alive. And yet, most of the disciples don't believe it. They're debating and discussing. They're skeptical about these reports. They're not ready to believe it. And then Jesus himself shows up. And even then, the disciples don't believe it. 
They, they say, we must be seeing a ghost, it must be a spirit, a vision, anything other than Jesus actually being alive. Whatever, whatever's going on here, it's not Jesus being alive. Jesus has to say, touch me. Look at my hands, look at my feet. Like, actually see physical, tangible evidence that I'm here. And they still don't believe him. So as they disbelieve for joy and amazement, that it's just too good to be true. This can't be happening. It's got to eat some fish in front of them before they finally, it finally sinks in. The disciples... Of all people, we're not talking about the Romans. We're not talking about the Sanhedrin. We're not talking about the Pharisees and Sadducees. We're talking about Jesus' own followers are skeptical until they get definitive proof that he's right there physically present. And so I always wonder, why are the disciples so excited and so happy at the end of the chapter when Jesus is gone? Because they've just been given this assignment to go not just to Jerusalem, to people who'd seen Jesus, not just to, to people who are Jews and, and sort of knew uh, about the scriptures or things like that. They're just going to go to all nations, to people who never encountered Jesus, who aren't Jewish, people who don't have any interest in obscure religions from the Middle East. They're not uh, people who are receptive to this, this message. And they're going to have to go and convince people that someone died and rose again. And they themselves needed excessive amounts of proof before they believed it. It's a pretty terrible assignment at this point, don't you think? It almost seems like Jesus is taking the exact wrong strategy for what he wants to accomplish. You would think that if he really cared about people believing that he rose from the dead, he would just go on world tour himself, you know? That he'd just stick around. Like, to send people out and not back them up and say, I can actually, you know, verify these claims that you're making is kind of counterintuitive. It's almost like taking your best player off of the field at, you know, at the critical moment in the game or holstering your best weapon when it really matters in the battle. Like, this, is, this is the wrong time for Jesus to get out of, the, out of the, the area. It just doesn't make sense. But what if Jesus knew exactly what he was doing? What if rather than this being the worst possible move, it was the best possible move that Jesus could make? What if instead of fleeing from the action, instead of getting off of the field, he was actually going to the most critical place he could possibly be? What if he was making the best move for the sake of the mission? He said in John 16, Very truly, I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. What if he meant that? What if it was true? Part of the problem for us is that we think of heaven as someplace distant, some place that is disconnected, peripheral to life, a place where it's uh, sort of um, a refuge from all of the turmoil and the action and activity of the world, some place where you escape so that you don't have to deal with the things that are going on here on earth. But the New Testament never talks about heaven that way. L- listen to just an example here. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, Paul says, Our struggle is not against flesh and blood but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. We, we see this vividly illustrated in the book of Revelation. We have the curtain pulled back on the cosmic drama that's being played out in heavenly realms, and there's so much more going on in heaven than we're used to thinking. Far, far more is going on, and it's of critical importance to life on earth. When Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, entered heaven, what he wasn't doing was getting off the field. He was getting into the most crucial position he could possibly be in. He was going to exactly where the action was. And it makes all the difference to what happens among his people. So what happens when Jesus enters heaven? What actually goes on there? Uh, To get at that, I think it would be interesting to explore a seemingly unrelated question, okay? The question is this. What exactly did Jesus say to his disciples when he started explaining the scriptures to them. There's these incredible stories, okay? On the road to Emmaus, Jesus shows up and he walks through Moses and the prophets and the Psalms and he says, look, they all point to me and they all predict all of this stuff. And you think when you read that, couldn't you have written down at least just a little bit of what he said? You know, like just a, just a snippet. It would have been really nice to get like Jesus's commentary on the Old Testament. It could have saved us a lot of trouble, wouldn't it? Like, when it says he stuck around for 40 days and he taught them all of this stuff, it's like, don't just summarize. Like, actually tell us. Like, this is a good time to include a sermon from Jesus right here so that we can know what he said. What if I told you that we actually could find out at least some of the things that he probably said during that time? What if I told you we actually had access to some of that? Some of his, Jesus' commentary, the, the, the verses he probably talked about and pointed to himself during that 40 days. I actually think... The New Testament, the rest of the New Testament documents are a record or at least a reflection 
of some of the things that Jesus said during that time. If you read the New Testament and and you're paying attention, you realize that on every single page, the Old Testament is referenced. Uh, There's an allusion, there's a quote, over and over again, probably four or five times on every page. It's almost as if the New Testament writers, the apostles, are, are reflecting on the Old Testament and explaining Jesus in light of that all the time. So I actually think that when we read the New Testament, we can get a glimpse of what he might be explaining. And in fact, from Luke 24, if you just go a few chapters ahead in the sequel to Luke in Acts, I actually think you get some of the things that that Peter and the apostles probably heard just a few weeks before. In Peter's sermon in Acts chapter 2, he cites the Old Testament three, four, five times, and he's explaining what what happened when Jesus died and rose again, what happened when he ascended, and what happened when the, the Holy Spirit came. And one of the things that he does is he uh, talks about David and he quotes the Psalms. This is what he does in Acts 2, verse 30. Let me read it to you. Peter says, David was a prophet and he knew that God had promised him an oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he, had not aband- that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, and now here's where Jesus quote, or Peter quotes Psalm 110. He says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. This is what's going on when Jesus ascends into heaven. He is fulfilling the Davidic covenant. He is ascending to the throne of David. He is being crowned as the rightful king of Israel and therefore the king of all the nations. Jesus ascends in order order to take his rightful place as David's heir, on the throne of the kingdom of God. And as the psalm implies that Peter quoted, when Jesus is on the throne, what it means is that the enemies of God's people are being subjected to the rule of Christ. They're being conquered and subdued. That's what a king does when he takes the throne. When a new dynasty arises, the first thing that, that happens, and the first order of business is to go through the realm and, and, and collect all the rebels and the traitors and bring order to the kingdom. That's what Jesus is doing on the throne. That's what David did when he ascended the throne. That's what the Messiah does when he takes to his throne. When Jesus takes his place on the throne, Jesus' enemies take their place at his feet. The rest of the New Testament echoes this again and again. Ephesians 1 says it this way, God raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. The ascension is the fulfillment of what Jesus did on earth. It's the outworking of his death and his resurrection. Jesus sits on the throne as the conqueror of sin and death, the one who vanquishes evil. And his enthronement means the dethronement of every lesser power that would seek to rule the universe. This is depicted really vividly if you read the book of Revelation. In the book of Revelation chapter 12, we get a really symbolic account of what's going on here. We get an account of both the beginning and the ending of Jesus' earthly ministry, of his birth and then his ascension. Let me read it to you. It says, A great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of twelve stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. And her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. In the passage, this woman is a symbolic representation of the people of God, and the child that is born is the Messiah. The the quote that's there, that he will rule all the nations with an iron scepter, that again is a quote from the Old Testament. It's from the Psalms. It's from Psalm 2, and it's talking about David's heir, about the Davidic king. And it says that this one who will rule the nations gets snatched up to God and to his throne. This is what we're talking about, the ascension of Jesus. And at first glance, when you read this, you think, oh, this is just getting Jesus kind of out of the way, out of the danger, um, that the trouble that the world is facing, he sort of gets to escape it and go back to heaven. But then you read what happens when he goes to heaven. It says this, then a war broke out in heaven. 
The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. And then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. The ascension of Jesus means the loss of authority for Satan. Up until this point, the devil has been permitted a limited measure of authority to hamper the people of God, to accuse them before the throne, to deceive the nations, to prevent the gospel from going out, to keep hearts hardened. And now, the evil one has been thrown down. He still rages, he still attacks, he still fights back, he hasn't been destroyed completely. The, one of the following verses says this, he is filled with fury because he knows that his time is short, but in spite of the devil's anger, his defeat is already assured. Jesus is king and he is on the throne. And between now and the end of the age, from his throne, Jesus is actively subjugating all of the forces that, that would oppress his, oppose his kingdom. That's what it says in 1 Corinthians. It says, the end will come when Jesus hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. This is why it is good news that Jesus went to heaven. This is why when Jesus leaves, it is not the undermining of the mission. It is actually the very best thing Jesus can do to promote the mission of his gospel in the world. If Jesus were not on the throne, we would have no reason to have confidence or hope or joy in bearing witness to him because all of the forces of evil would continue to be uh, opposing us in a way that we couldn't overcome. But because King Jesus is on the throne, those forces are being subdued. This is also where we get to the matter of the Holy Spirit. Again, in, in Ephesians 4, Paul quotes the Psalms. He quotes Psalm 68 to talk about the ascension, and this is what he says. He says, to each one of us, grace has been given, just as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. And then he goes on to explain all of the spiritual gifts that the Holy Spirit brings. The idea here is that Jesus is the conquering king and he's won a battle and now he has all of the spoils to give out to his people to equip them for the things that they need to go out to do. And the way he dispenses those gifts is by sending the Holy Spirit to empower us to carry out the mission. When Jesus ascends, we are not left on our own. We are sent out to bear witness with, with his strength. We're not supposed to go out and convince people by our own power, our own cleverness. We're not supposed to open people's eyes with our own uh, persuasion that we muster up on our own. We don't bring justice by our own strength. We don't uh, fight evil on our own power. We don't have to open closed doors or awaken dead hearts or heal sick bodies or convict people of sin. That's not our job. That's the Spirit's job, the one who lives in us. We are sent out in the exact same Spirit that empowered Jesus in His ministry. He actually fills us with the Spirit that enables us to go out and overcome all of the things that would oppose the gospel. And so this, this is why the ascension is good news for us, those who are sent out. This is why it is more advantageous for Jesus to go than to remain here. The king is on the throne, and his spirit is in his people, so we can be bold. I think this is incredibly relevant for us right here and right now. We're at the end of a semester. We're looking out to what comes next, what happens after graduation, what happens during the summer, where we go from here. And I have had so much joy and being with you guys over this year. Being able to get to know you, being able to minister to you, minister with you, to have conversations about what it means to be faithful to Christ in the different contexts and the different callings that you have. I have been so blessed and so privileged uh, to be a part of this community this year. And as I've been reading these passages and studying the ascension, I have been thinking about you. I've been thinking about what this means for you as you go out to the next chapter. As you look ahead, in just a matter of weeks, matter of months, you, many of you are going to be taking on new assignments. You're going to be going to places uh, that you ha have never been before. You're going to be crossing cultures. You're going to be learning languages. You're going to be uh, going to, to new neighborhoods, new cities, trying to reach people, taking up jobs with coworkers who don't believe the gospel, trying to, 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 to love and to bless them. And I know that that is a scary thing. That is a daunting and difficult thing. And as I read these passages, what I want to say to you is this. Do not be afraid. Because the king is on his throne. 
and his spirit is in you. Some of you are going to situations that are very different than what you expected when you came into grad school. Uh, You're going off to a a situation where the door has been closed, the opportunity you thought would be there isn't there. Uh, Maybe your your visa has been denied for a country you thought you were going to go serve in. Maybe uh, a job has has evaporated that you thought you had lined up. Uh, The ministry you thought you were were working with, that's not going to work out. And you're uncertain and and, and you're discouraged. And I want to say to you, do not be discouraged. Because the king is on the throne and his spirit is in you. Some of you are going to places where you know you will face skepticism. Where it's going to be ridiculous for you to claim the name of Jesus. Where where people are going to mock Christians and criticize the church and be hardened to the gospel. And I want to say to you, you can be bold because the king is on the throne and his spirit is in you. Some of you are going into a, a situation where you feel like you are weighed down by personal tragedy. Like even now, death and loss and suffering are weighing on you. You're dealing with sorrow. Despair is flooding in. It is hard to think of offering hope to other people when you feel like it's so hard to hold on to hope for yourself. And I want to say to you, do not lose heart. Because it is true, the king is on the throne. And his spirit is in you. We've all been called to bear burdens. Some of you have been called to minister to people with serious mental health issues. And you're going into situations where it seems like, humanly speaking, your work is going to be in vain. Or you're going to be helping people where there are no easy solutions, no quick answers, uh, no, no easy breakthroughs, no, no final cure. And you're thinking, I, I don't know if I have what it takes to persevere in serving and loving and, and caring for people when it seems like there's no breakthrough for them. And I want to say to you, keep persevering because the king is on the throne and his spirit is in you. Some of you are going to places of significant poverty, places where there are needs that are impossible to meet, where there are people in situations that you cannot help, where there are structures and systems that you cannot influence. You're going to places marked by conflict and violence and strife where division haunts everything that you do and you're called to be an agent of peace where there is no peace. You're going to places where the governments oppose the work of the church, the cause of Christ. Your ministries are hampered. Your churches are harassed. Your leaders are vulnerable. And what I say, want to say to you is be bold, be strong, be courageous because the truth is the king is on the throne And his spirit is in you. Whatever your assignment, whatever you have been called to do, whatever forces of evil resist you in it, whatever cost you must pay, whatever burden you must bear, I want to urge you, take heart, be bold, be strong. God has not left us alone. We have a mighty king on the throne, a savior who intercedes for us and rules for us. Our enemies have been cast down. The gospel is going forward in all the nations. We have the spirit of God filling us with power and joy and courage. And whatever else may seem to be the case, this is what we know. Evil will not get the last word. Hope will not disappoint. And the kingdom of God will prevail because the king is on the throne. And his spirit is in you. Amen.